Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Maté. My guest is Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, the former Chief of Staff to Secretary of State Colin Powell, currently a distinguished professor at the College of William and Mary. Colonel Wilkerson, we have been covering on Pushback the scandal at the OPCW, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, where a series of leaks uh, put out by WikiLeaks and uh, released by whistleblowers from the OPCW show that there were major internal doubts about the allegation that the Syrian government committed a chemical weapons attack in the city of Douma in April 2018. This allegation led to airstrikes by the US, France, and Britain. And what the leaked documents and testimony show so far is that OPCW officials, including scientists and people who were deployed on the ground in Douma, complained that their findings were being uh, excluded from the OPCW's public reports and also distorted, and that the collect evidence that was collected actually pointed to uh, this attack being staged on the ground rather than there being a chemical weapons attack by the Assad government. And reportedly, according to one whistleblower, this was done, this manipulation at the OPCW, this was done under direct U.S. pressure. What do you make of what we've heard so far? I had heard this all along and had been following it uh, off and on just to see if I could pick up some pieces that would confirm or deny this for me. Um, my initial assessment of the situation was when people were talking about VX or sarin, I, you know, I, I know what VX and sarin can do to you. And I know that people standing beside a crater hours after the munition has struck that's supposed to spread this gas is preposterous. They'd be dead. <laughs> they'd still be there, and they'd be dead. That's how vicious these uh, these chemicals are. So I knew it probably wasn't military-grade VX or sarin or anything like that. It was probably some sort of chlorine or low-grade uh, chemical weapon, which was commensurate with what I knew was in the remnants of Assad's chemical weapon stockpile. My suspicions were confirmed by people from the group, the military group, mostly Army, who actually destroyed 600 metric tons of Assad's chemical weapons. Um, they were the principal agent operating for the OPCW uh, in order to destroy those weapons. And they said they didn't think there were that many weapons left over. That is, that they didn't find that they didn't destroy. After all, 600 metric tons is a lot of chemical weapons. Uh, but that he could have held some back, but they didn't think that he held anything really vicious back. Uh, maybe some low-grade chlorine things that w w would reinforce my view that if he did use them, it was probably chlorine. Then I began to hear what you're talking about now from a couple of people who had worked for the OPCW or had been very close to the OPCW, that there was a lot of dissent within the ranks because um, there had been pressure brought on them by the Secretary General at the UN, but he was pressured by the UN, US um, to report otherwise than what they thought had actually happened. Then I heard an assessment of what had actually happened, which was in essence even less than I thought. The combustion of conventional munitions with the surrounding environment, chemicals in that environment and so forth, which are always there, had operated in such a way chemical way to produce what was the equivalent of a low-grade chlorine, and that's what made people sick and ill and so forth at the site, at least the one site that I was looking at. And so I began to realize that probably the same thing had happened as happened when I was in government with the IAEA, the, the uh, Atomic uh, Oversight Group, where we brought pressure on the director of the IAEA and on members of the IAEA uh, to report things that weren't quite what they were with regard, for example, to Iran's nuclear program. Uh, these things were suggested by, guess who? Israel. And these things became things the IAE, not, not dramatically, but gradually let leak into its reporting about Iran. So yes, these international groups like the IAEA and the OPCW, they are subject to pressure from the great superpower from the American empire, just like everybody else is in the world. I mean, we bugged the UN Security Council. The NSA bugged the UN Security Council 
to listen to the 15 members as they deliberated whether or not they were going to vote for or against the second resolution on the Iraq war in January of 2003. We bugged our friends, our allies. We bugged Secretary Powell. And, you know, this is what we do. So I, I, I'm not too uh, surprised by the OPCW leaks. You know, what you say there about the chlorine traces, one of the suppressed findings, the, one of the findings that was never public until it was exposed by these whistleblowers, was that the inspectors on the ground in Duma found traces of chlorine, which was the alleged chemical uh, weapon used, found traces of chlorine that were no different than everyday traces of chlorine that could be found in any environment. But that finding was excluded and ultimately distorted inside the OPCW's uh, public report. And, you know, speaking of, of Bush administration pressure on international organizations, I'm, I'm wondering if you were familiar with what happened with Jose Bustani, who was the uh, first director general of the OPCW, and is now, uh, after hearing testimony from one of these new whistleblowers, he is now sounding the alarm and voicing serious concern that his, his former organization was manipulated. But the reason why his presence here is even uh, all the more important, on top of being the OPCW's first director general, is because he was infamously removed from his position after being threatened by John Bolton because Bustani was getting in the way of the Bush administration's drive to war on Iraq. Yes, absolutely. John Bolton brought the same kind of pressure to bear on the IAEA. Bolton had absolutely no compunction about lying. He lied about Cuba. And when we called him on it, when Christian Westerman from the INR at state, the Intelligence Bureau at state, called him on it, he threatened to get Christian fired. And thank God uh, Secretary Armitage and uh, Secretary Ford, the assistant secretary who was Christian's boss, stood up for him. And Christian's, uh, as I understand it now, a stalwart member of, of, of the State Department. But that's John Bolton. Lie, cheat, and steal. Get whatever you can. Hmm. And in a previous in a previous segment, uh, you talked about having uh, seen the memo that General Wesley Clark infamously uh, discussed publicly about seeing this basically a target list of uh, seven countries that were going to be targeted by the Bush administration for regime change. Iran was one of them, which we discussed, and Syria was one of them too. And I'm wondering if you see what has happened in Syria over the last several years where the U.S. has joined with the Gulf states and Turkey in launching a brutal proxy war, which drew in Iran and Qasem Soleimani uh, was very involved in, in, in pushing back that proxy war to defend the Assad government. If you see uh, that proxy war as a part of that uh, regime change uh, manifesto of sorts that you witnessed back when you were inside the Bush administration. Yes, I, I think that's what President Obama meant in the Roosevelt Room in 2015, September 2015, when he said to me and General Paul Eaton that there was a bias in Washington towards war. There was a bias in this town towards war. He'd been sucked into Libya. He'd been sucked into Syria. Um, it, it, the subsequent conversation in the Oval, as we were getting ready to take a picture and everything, um, leads me to believe that it, he made a decision not to put ground troops into Syria based on his his blossoming knowledge of how much he had been trapped with regard to Libya. Uh, he was lecturing John Kerry that day. You may recall that John Kerry was advocating ground troops in Syria, and Obama was lecturing him that day in front of us that he wasn't going to put any ground troops in Syria, not significant numbers anyway. But even a president who was somewhat disinclined to do this sort of thing got wrapped up in this bias towards war and started doing things. Look at Libya. It's a catastrophe now. Look at Syria. Uh, Assad is having grave difficulties even trying to put it back together and attract some of the millions of the diaspora we created back to Syria. Um, we have created a nightmare. We talk about Iran creating a crescent, a Shia crescent. That's Pompeo's favorite term. Well, Iran might be creating a Shia crescent. It could not possibly be as bad as the, quote, crescent the United States has created of destruction and death and mayhem all across the region. Well, look, speaking of, of Kerry and Sarah, I want to play you a clip because it's quite striking. And I think it speaks to what you're talking about, where Kerry was speaking to a group of Syrian opposition activists back when he was secretary of state. And the audio got leaked. And one of the uh, 
things he said in it was that he acknowledged that the Obama administration watched as Daesh, as ISIS, was advancing on Damascus. And the U.S. didn't do anything because they thought that this could strengthen their negotiating position, uh, even possibly being prepared to see Damascus fall to ISIS. So let's, let's go to that clip. The reason Russia came in is because ISIL was getting stronger. Daesh was threatening the possibility of going to Damascus and so forth. And that's why Russia came in, because they didn't want a Daesh government. And they supported Assad. And, and, uh, and we know that this was, this was growing. We were watching. We saw that, that Daesh was growing in strength. And we thought Assad was threatened. Uh, we thought, however, we could probably manage, uh, you know, that Assad might then negotiate. Instead of negotiating, you got Assad. Now you got the Putin to support him. So that's Secretary of State John Kerry uh, explaining the rationale for watching the growth of ISIS inside Syria. Colonel Wilkerson, I'm wondering your response. Well, I, I've got to say this, taking out of context a little bit, I can understand why Kerry might have been looking at it from the very meow politique way he was looking at it. At least that's what the, the, the context seems to imply. So let's just back up for a moment and let's look at what really ISIS consisted of, Daesh. What we have, and I knew this immediately when I saw fire direction centers being operated and tanks being operated, you know, these people couldn't have done that. These people that Abu Musab al-Zarqawi inspired when we uh, essentially created him in Iraq when we invaded. What happened was all of those discontented Sunnis, 100,000 plus of them, who were part of Saddam's Republican Guard and part of his army in general, they decided once we had sort of left it to the uh, government in Baghdad that we'd put in place to do its thing, that they weren't being politically empowered. They, indeed, they were being jailed. They were being murdered. They were being killed in their homes. So they again said the United States is a lie. They don't do what they promise. We are going to take care of ourselves. And so they joined ISIS. And then you got the artillery and the tanks and the mechanized infantry and so forth. And you got a threat because it was really the remnants of Saddam's army, the best remnants of that army. Um, so, you know, it, it was understandable, I guess, from a real politique sort of way that we might have been looking at that and thinking, well, we don't like Bashar al-Assad. Maybe this is going to take care of Bashar al-Assad. Who cares if they're going to establish an Islamic caliphate? Because we knew, and this is another point I've got to throw out here, Iraq, Iran, Assad, they didn't, it would have been a bloody long-term conflict to be sure, but they didn't need any outside help to defeat this bunch of people. They could have defeated Daesh, ISIS, whatever you want to call them, al-Baghdadi's group, they could have defeated them on their own. It had been a longer fight. It had been a bloodier fight. But it might have been a better outcome, ultimately, because there wouldn't have been all these outside forces like Russia, the United States, Saudi Arabia, and others taking advantage of that to try and unseat Assad and creating an absolute disaster in Syria, which is what we did. Uh, Banda, uh, Prince Bandar in charge of the Saudi element going in there. And all these different... We had CIA and military elements shooting at each other inside Syria. We were so incompetent. We had CIA supporting one al-Qaeda faction and, and uh, the military supporting another al-Qaeda faction, and they're fighting each other. And we're supporting both and arming both. It's preposterous what we were doing. President Obama hinted at a little bit, a little bit of this in the Roosevelt Room. Um, but it, it was it was a terrible situation that we created. But I, I don't want to blame John Kerry for those kinds of remarks, because I understand probably why he was making them. Uh, and I also understand why Russia finally came in. Let's face it. Uh, probably one of the smartest guys in the world right now, as much as I think he's a deplorable human being and a deplorable tyrant in Moscow, is Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin has stolen a march on us from Crimea to Ukraine, to the Baltics, to Syria, to the Arctic Ocean, 
to Libya. I mean, now he's got a problem with Erdogan in Libya. But nonetheless, Putin is playing from a really weak hand and he's beating us every time he turns around. So Putin coming into Syria was no surprise. I think Putin would have come into, Superior, uh, into Syria if there had been any threat to Assad because Syria is the last bastion of any Russian southern tier effort to defend itself. I mean, that's where he has his forces abroad, if you will, that are aimed at defending the southern tier of Russia. Um, we have 800 bases, Aaron, in the world. Uh, the rest of the world together, including Russia and China, Russia and China have barely 80. Uh, so Russia's got to have at least one base, it feels, I'm sure, uh, and I'm sure Putin does. And, and, and that is it. So he was going to come to Syria uh, re despite what happened if he thought that was threatened. Right. And also, I mean, if we take Kerry's word seriously, that, you know, if the prospect of ISIS taking Damascus was real and the U.S. was just standing by, well, then... ISIS controlling Damascus certainly would be a security threat to many people beyond just people but inside Putin, Syria, yeah. but, but to Russia as well. Yeah, but Putin, yeah, you're right. Putin would never have let that happen and, 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 and didn't. And I, I think it's fair to say Iran would not have let that happen either. Iran and ISIS are mortal enemies. Well, uh, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, we really appreciate your time. Uh, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson is the former Chief of Staff to Secretary of State Colin Powell, currently a distinguished professor at the College of William & Mary. Thank you very much. Aaron, can I say one more Please. thing? Please. I'm going to step out on a limb here. I'm going to say if the United States withdrew all of its forces from Bahrain, where we have the largest fleet headquarters, from al Udeid, where we have one of the largest air bases in the world, from al Khalif in Saudi Arabia, from Kuwait, where we have the largest logistic and reception and onward movement uh, uh, facility in the world. If we withdrew all of our forces and moved as we were for 40 plus years offshore into marine amphibious ready groups and carrier battle groups and so forth, and just you know looked at the region from that position where we could strike if we needed to, uh, whenever we need to, if we took every single soldier, airman, sailor, marine, out of the Middle East tomorrow morning, we'd be better off. We'll leave it there. Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, thank you so much. Thank you.